history, apologetics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. The Epiphany, as told in the Life of Christ, by the Reverend L. C. Filion. The mysterious star of the Magi has always been, and no doubt will ever be, the subject of countless discussions. When the Magi reach Jerusalem, the remarkable expression they use is, We have seen his star, the star of the newborn king, the star that, so to speak, designated him personally and belonged to him. This trait is in perfect agreement with the ideas of the ancient world, which believed that heavenly phenomena presided over the principal events taking place on earth, and at the birth, during the life, and at the death of great personages. But as the Magi leisurely contemplated and examined that star, whatever may have been its nature, how did they understand that it was the special star of the king of the Jews, and that this king had just been born? To answer this question, we must bear in mind that at that time there was felt throughout the Roman Empire, in the East more than elsewhere, a presentiment, at times precise and then again rather vague, of a new era that was about to open upon mankind. Judea was looked upon as the starting point of this golden age, over which a mighty and glorious personage was to preside. The Jews were expecting the Messiah at that period with great enthusiasm. Their whole literature was messianic. As the sons of Israel had entered into most of the provinces of the empire, in all places devoting themselves to a very earnest proselytism, and making no mystery either of their religion or of their Messiah. It is thanks to them that those hopes arose and spread, which held so many minds in suspense. The pagan religions were crumbling and falling into pieces. The large numbers of noble souls were joining Judaism, in bonds more or less close. The presentiment of which we speak is explicitly attested by several of the great writers of Rome, particularly Virgil and Tacitus, as well as the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. The ancient astronomical tablets of Babylon showed great interest in Palestine. They contained predictions like, A great king will arise in the West, and with him a veritable golden age will begin. This explains that there were as far away as the distant East men who were expecting the liberator of mankind, and who were seeking in the stars where it was thought one could read everything and find out everything, the first signs of his coming. The Magi were of this number, and so when they suddenly perceived, in the wonderful clear sky of their country, an astral phenomenon of extraordinary nature, they regarded it as a sign and at once established a close relation between it and the birth of the future Redeemer. For those astronomers, the star was, according to St. Augustine's beautiful thought, a visible language, quite capable of attracting their attention and stirring their faith. But evidently, to that language from without was added a much clearer message, a divine revelation, which made its meaning precise and urged them to go and offer their homage in person to the King of the Jews. Let us remark in passing the wondrous ways of God, who providentially adapts his graces and inspirations to the inner dispositions of those whom he deigns to draw to himself. Later on, we shall see Christ winning Galilean fishermen by miraculous drafts of fishes, the sick by cures, the doctors of the law by explanations of sacred texts. We now see him summoning the Magi, the astronomers, by a star in the firmament. The inquiry which the Magi made in Jerusalem, although apparently so harmless, at once produced an impression which they were far from having foreseen. The star had revealed to them the birth of the king of the Jews, but it had not indicated the exact spot where they could find him. They had, therefore, come directly to Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish kingdom, confident of obtaining reliable information there. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? they asked, for we have seen his star in the east, and are come to adore him. In a few brief words, the sacred writer dramatically describes the effect produced in the city by the unexpected news brought by the Magi. Flying from mouth to mouth, it soon crossed the threshold of the royal palace, arousing keen elation or frantic alarm. And King Herod, hearing this, was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Many a time, and often for less serious reason, had the old despot trembled for his life and his usurped throne. He was king of Palestine, not by right, but through intrigue and violence. 
detested by most of his subjects because of his tyranny and his anti-theocratic conduct, and extremely jealous of his authority. And now he suddenly learns that he is a powerful rival, the Messiah himself, and in anguish he wonders whether he will be able to successfully combat him. The inhabitants of Jerusalem had likewise their reason for being troubled. Their excitement was caused, on the one hand, by the thought that they were about to see the realization of the messianic hopes which were thrilling all hearts, and, on the other hand, by a fear of the blood that Herod would probably shed in order to save his crown. The king recovered himself very quickly. His cleverness did not fail him in these delicate circumstances. He was no less anxious than the Magi to ascertain where this rival of his was living. Without losing a moment's time, he took two steps, one official and public, the other secret, which would, he thought, reveal that information with certainty. He concealed his anger, and, as it was primarily a religious fact, he convoked the great ecclesiastical council of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, in extraordinary session, and put the plain question, where should Christ be born? The answer was easy. Those to whom he put the question answered at once, clearly and briefly, in Bethlehem of Judah. And they justified the reply by an utterance by the prophet Micaeus, quoting its words rather freely, but its meaning very correctly, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come forth the captain that shall rule my people Israel. Micaeus 5.2 Herod was now in possession of two certain data. He had learned through the Magi that the Messiah was born, through the Sanhedrin, the exact location of his birthplace. He desired a third bit of information that would enable him to carry out the homicidal project already stirring in his mind. He therefore called the Magi together secretly so as not to arouse attention, and with the greatest care informed himself as to the exact time when the star appeared to them. He surmised that some connection existed between that date and the date of the Messiah's birth. Then, sending the Magi to Bethlehem, he told them, Go and diligently inquire after the child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I also may come and adore him. The Magi delayed not in taking the road to Bethlehem. Their joy was unbounded, when upon leaving Jerusalem they saw before them, brighter than ever, the star which had appeared to them in the east, but which had afterwards vanished. Moreover, everyone in their country knew the road leading to Palestine. It was evening, and the kindly star advanced before them, not only showing them the route to be followed, but making it plain to them that they had not been misled and that they were approaching the desired goal. Suddenly the star stopped, casting its rays upon a humble dwelling in the little town, the house, as the travelers at once understood, which sheltered the king whom they had come to seek. We know from St. Luke's account that Christ was born in a stable. If Matthew speaks of a house, It is no doubt because, after the pressure of the first days, which had brought so many outsiders to Bethlehem on account of the census, Joseph was able to procure more suitable lodging. Can we not imagine the Magi's emotion as entering into the house they found the child with Mary his mother, and falling down they adored him? In these words of exquisite simplicity the evangelist relates the meeting of the Oriental visitors with the king of the Jews, the king of the whole world. Should we take literally the words they adored him and understand this expression in its full and complete theological significance? Taken by itself, the expression means only a very respectful homage shown by the humble attitude of prostration. Nevertheless, everything leads us to believe that the Magi, receiving a still more specific revelation from heaven, recognized the divine nature of Mary's Son and adored him as the true Son of God. The Holy Fathers entertain no doubts in this matter. These fervent adorers of Christ did not permit themselves to be influenced by the outward circumstances, which at first sight seem so unfavorable for the divine infant. Neither his poverty, nor his seeming helplessness, nor his silence put any obstacle in the way of their faith. The presents which they offered to Jesus according to the ancient custom of the East which does not permit anyone to approach a great personage empty-handed, 
are another pledge of the fullness of their simple and generous faith. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In their minds, these gifts certainly had a symbolic meaning, which the earliest ecclesiastical writers have indicated with some differences. The most usual and most natural interpretation is that the gold was presented to a king, myrrh for a man, and incense for God. The Magi seem to have made a very short stay at Bethlehem. The Gospel account would almost give us to understand that they passed only a few hours there. In their frankness, they had taken Herod's hypocritical protestations seriously and were prepared to return to Jerusalem to bring him the information he had requested. But the cruel tyrant's scheme was thwarted by God, who, in a supernatural dream, informed the travelers to take a different route for their return journey. They promptly obeyed and disappeared as mysteriously as they had come. From Bethlehem there is no lack of roads going east to the other side of the Jordan by which to reach the plateau of Moab where the eastern caravans passed. Attention has often been drawn to the striking contrast between the conduct of these pagans and that of the Jews of Jerusalem respecting the newborn Messiah. As we previously remarked, it is the fulfillment of Simeon's prophecy. Judaism rejects Jesus. The Gentile world welcomes him. The Magi undertake a long and wearisome journey to come to adore him. Herod wishes to take the life of Christ. The chief priests and the scribes confined themselves to indicating the place where he was to be born. Like mileposts that mark the highway, but do not leave their place, so they do not think of inconveniencing themselves to go to him. What prospects, one filled with hope, the other with sadness, for the future of the divine master and his church. Israel is rejected through its own fault and cedes to the pagan world the privileged rank which the divine plan had so bountifully accorded to it. Danger hovered over the Christ child, but God did not abandon him to Herod's cruelty. The very night of the Magi's departure from Bethlehem, an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and fly into Egypt, and be there until I shall tell thee, for it will come to pass that Herod will seek the child to destroy him. This message was urgent, as was the danger. Joseph understood this. So, without asking any further explanation, he takes the child and mother, those two beings who were so dear to him, and rapidly directs his steps toward Egypt. What exemplary obedience was his, ever so prompt and unreserved, although calling for hard and trying deeds. We'll be back with more from the housetops after this break. So, Connie, I hope you and Kathleen had a beautiful Christmas. We certainly did, Mary Ann, the same with you and all your family. Yes, and our radio family. Don't forget them. Without them and their support. And speaking of support, no matter how small you think your donation is, it is huge when you put them all together. Thank you. A most happy and holy new year. On the WQPH 89.3 FM community calendar, St. Cecilia's Parish on Mechanic Street in Lemonster is having a calendar raffle for January. It's a fundraiser for the church. The calendars are $15 each or three calendars for $40. There will be a cash prize every day during the month of January. Those prizes will be drawn on Facebook. So you'll be able to find out whether or not you won over there on Facebook each day in January. If you want more information or wish to purchase a calendar, you can call the rectory at 978-537-6541. That's 978-537-6541 for the St. Cecilia's in Lemonster Christmas Calendar Raffle. This has been the WQPH 89.3 FM Community Calendar. Hello, my name is uh, Father Tian Nguyen, and at source is at uh, San Leo in Lemonster, Massachusetts, and I just wish you a happy new year to all Americans and also Vietnamese people and everybody that may Christ live in your hearts and open your mind, your hearts, and welcome Him and love uh, God all the way to heaven.
Okay, so you'll never guess who just dropped by our studio, your favorite priest, Father Bob Doherty. <laughs> Father Bob Doherty, do you have some well wishes and blessings for our listeners? Absolutely. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you will. For all of us, life is a journey of love and pain. So we have to have Easter Sunday, but before that, we always have to do Good Friday. So for ourselves, we know that if we have confidence in God, God's all, nothing's going to overcome God, not sin, not death, not the, because the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, has given us eternal life. He's given us peace. So we know that life is not the problem. We all have problems. Some people have more than others. Life is not a problem to be solved. It's the mystery to be lived, the mystery of God's love. He loves an everlasting love for us. He loves us today. He loves us tomorrow. He loves us forever. It's hard to surrender all our problems over to God, but by surrendering the problems to God, we can become more peaceful, more joyful, more hopeful that all is going to be well, all is well today, all will be well tomorrow, and all will be well forever. We ask, invoke the Holy Spirit to be with us, all your family, all your friends, especially those who are fragile, those in hospitals, nursing homes, those who are not feeling well, men the Regina, the average age is 88 years of age. So like there's one person, Father Mark Riley, 59, they call him a kid. Hey kid, what are you doing in here? So for ourselves, we know that God is good and we try to walk in the way of the Lord. Amen. Amen. What beautiful Thanksgiving and Christmas message you have given us that we can use all the time. So pray for Father Bob Doherty. He's not 88. Not he's, yet. He's, he's probably... <laughs> not yet. I'm 79. 79. He's just a, a pup. That's right. He's a, uh, one of the great priests in the Diocese of Boston. We've been happy to have him come on our pilgrimages, Pastor Sacred Heart Church, fabulous pastor. God bless you, Father, for all you have done for God. Keep up the great apostles. The great apostles are so important for people to understand that God is and God loves them. Amen. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> You are listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchberg. And now a word from author Peter and Jimmy, who is the host of Your Prayer Intentions, taking place every Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Whether you're donating money or giving us prayers, without you, we don't go on. And if you do want to help us go on, please consider going to wqphradio.org. There's a donate button there. You can give once, you can give monthly, and it makes a difference. It keeps all of our shows, and we have a great lineup of shows, keeps us going. And whether you're a fan of uh, your prayer intentions, whether you like Steve's show, Benedict's Hammer Sundays at Midnight, whether you like Brother Matthew and Brother Anthony from From the Housetops, which is on Sundays, 10.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. Whether you're a fan of the Children's Rosary, which we have every day at 5 p.m., seven days a week. Whether you like our local matter show, which is Saturday at 11, or Talk Catholic, which comes right after us at 12.30. Larry's Music Off, Sunday at 11 a.m. We have the Shepherd's Pie Saturdays at 1 p.m. Or Dan and Tom with the 13th Apostle, which comes just before us at 11.30. Any of those shows and all the stuff you donate, you help these things come out. But what also at the WQPH website, in addition to podcasts of our shows, is the prayer wall. Right on the prayer wall, support WQPH and get WQPH 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on WQPHradio.org. Oh, the greatness of this glorious day, the Epiphany, on which begins the movement of all nations towards the Church, the true Jerusalem. Oh, the mercy of our Heavenly Father, who has been mindful of all these people that were buried in the shades of death and sin. Behold, the glory of the Lord has risen upon the holy city, and kings sit out to find it and to seek the light. Jerusalem is not large enough to hold all the sea of nations. Another city must be founded, and towards her shall be turned the countless Gentiles of Median and Epha. Thou, O Rome, art this holy city, and thy heart shall wonder and be enlarged. Heretofore thy victories have won thee slaves, but from this day forward thou shalt draw within thy walls countless children. Lift up thine eyes and see. All these, that is the whole human race, give themselves to thee as thy sons and daughters. They come to receive from thee a new birth. Open wide thine arms 
and embrace them that come from north and south, bringing gold and frankincense to him who is thy king and ours. The Magi, the first fruits of the Gentile world, have been admitted into the court of the great king whom they have been seeking, and we have followed them. The child has smiled upon us, as he did upon them. All the fatigues of the long journey which man must take to reach his God, all are over and forgotten. Our Emmanuel is with us, and we are with him. Bethlehem has received us, and we will not leave her again. For in Bethlehem we have the child and Mary his mother. Where else could we find riches like these that Bethlehem gives us? O oh, let us beseech this incomparable mother to give us this child of hers, for he is our light and our love and our bread of life, now that we are about to approach his altar led by the star of faith. Let us at once open our treasures. Let us prepare our gold, our frankincense, and our myrrh for the sweet babe, our king. He will be pleased with our gifts, and we know he never suffers himself to be outdone in generosity. When we have to return to our duties, we will, like the Magi, leave our hearts with our Jesus. And it shall be by another way, by a new manner of life, that we will finish our sojourn in this country of our exile, and look forward to that happy day when life and light eternal will come and absorb into themselves the shadows of vanity and time which now hang over us. We also, O Jesus, come to adore thee on this glorious epiphany which brings all nations to thy feet. We walk in the footsteps of the Magi, for we too have seen the star, and we are come to thee. Glory be to thee, dear King, to thee who did say in the canticle of David thine ancestor, I am appointed king over Sion, the holy mountain, that I may preach the commandment of the Lord. The Lord has said to me that he will give me the Gentiles for my inheritance and the utmost parts of the earth for my possession. Now therefore, O ye kings, understand, receive instruction, ye that judge the earth. Thou wilt say, O Emmanuel, with thine own lips, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And a few years later, the whole earth will have received thy law. Even now Jerusalem is troubled, Herod is trembling on his throne, but the day is at hand when the heralds of thy coming will go throughout the whole world, proclaiming that he, who was the desired of the nations, is come. The word that is to subject the earth to thee will go forth, and like an immense fire will stretch to the utmost parts of the universe. In vain will the strong ones of this world attempt to arrest its course. An emperor will propose to the Senate, as the only means of staying the progress of thy conquests, that thy name be solemnly enrolled in the list of those gods whom you came to destroy. Other emperors will endeavor to abolish thy kingdom by the slaughter of thy soldiers. But all these efforts are vain. The day will come when the cross, the sign of thy power, will adorn the imperial banner. The emperors will lay their crowns at thy feet, and proud Rome will cease to be the capital of the empire of this world's strength and power, in order that she may become forever the center of thy peaceful and universal kingdom. We already see the dawn of that glorious day. Thy conquests, O King of Ages, begin with thine epiphany. Thou callest from the extreme parts of the unbelieving East the first fruits of that Gentile world, which hitherto had not been thy people, and which is now to form thine inheritance. Henceforth there is to be no distinction of Jew and Greek, of barbarian and Scythian. You loved man above angel, for thou hast redeemed the one, while you have left the other in his fall. If thy predilection for a long period of ages was for the race of Abraham, henceforth thy preference is to be given to the Gentiles. Israel was but a single people. We are numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars of the firmament. Israel was under the law of fear. Thou hast reserved the law of love for us. From this day of thy manifestation, O divine King, begins thy separation from the synagogue, which refuses thy love. On this same day thou takest, in the person of the Magi, the Gentiles as thy spouse. Thy union with her will soon be proclaimed from the cross, when turning thy face from the ungrateful Jerusalem, thou wilt stretch forth thy hands towards the nations of the Gentiles. O ineffable joy of thy birth, but O still better joy of thine epiphany, wherein we, the once disinherited, 
are permitted to approach to thee, offer thee our gifts, and see thee graciously accept them, O merciful Emmanuel. Thanks be to thee, O infant God, for that unspeakable gift of faith, which, as thy apostle teaches us, hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into thy kingdom, making us partakers of the lot of the saints in light. Give us grace to grow in the knowledge of this thy gift, and to understand the importance of this great day, wherein thou makest alliance with the whole human race. From the Housetops Radio features the same Catholic doctrine, spirituality, church history, and apologetics published for over 40 years in From the Housetops magazine. This program, dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, promotes her cause in the age-old conflict with the powers of darkness. From the Housetops on WQPH 89.3 FM. When we are in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, we do not take sufficient account of what it cost our Lord to descend so low. He was obliged to leave the bosom of his Father, to come down to earth and not to be received here, to take refuge in a stable and to escape death only by flight. He was obliged after thirty years of a laborious and hidden life, after three years employed in evangelizing the people and doing them good, and receiving in return calumnies, outrages, ignominy and death, to survive by the institution of the Eucharist, in order to remain in the midst of the men who had treated him so unworthily. The more he has suffered on the road, the more love he shows us. O love, how incomprehensible thou art! We ought to be profoundly touched by the outrages committed against so loving a God. David and Jeremiah are melted to tears, and are parched with grief at the sight of the sins of the ancient people. How would they feel if they could but witness the far more guilty sins of the new people? St. Teresa could not think of them without giving vent to cries of sorrow and of desolation. She gathered her nuns together and exclaimed to them, My sisters, love is not loved. Let us love the love which is not loved. All the saints have felt the same grief at seeing the love of Jesus in the Eucharist, scorned by the ingratitude of men. And each time they had tidings of a profanation, It was as though a sword had pierced their soul. We must make reparation for all these evils by fervent, honorable amends to the Blessed Sacrament. Offer it in expiation of all our reverence, all the homage of the angels and the saints, all our actions and our life itself. Protest that it would be a happiness to us to shed our blood to spare it the least offense or to repair it. And finally, live today in a more holy manner than usual. Visit the Blessed Sacrament with more love. Communicate henceforth with more fervor. Assist at the holy sacrifice more piously and more frequently. Well, that concludes our program for this week. We hope you've enjoyed listening to From the Housetops Radio. Until next time, God bless you. From the Housetops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.